right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at the University of New England. We're just going to go ahead and let people kind of come in and get settled before we officially start our MSOT 2024-2025 application walkthrough. Just letting people kind of make their way in. Before we start, I do want to just remind everyone that we are going to be recording this session. So we'll be recording it and posting it on YouTube for you to be able to use it as a resource at a later date. And we'll also be sending it out to those who weren't able to join us today. So definitely keep your eyes peeled for an email from us if you're interested in kind of recounting this information in the future as you begin your OTCAS application. I firstly want to introduce myself and once again welcome you all because I think we're all in now. This is the 2024-2025 MSOT application walkthrough. My name is Maya and I'm a recruitment coordinator here at the University of New England in our Office of Graduate Admissions and Recruitment and I'm joined by two of my colleagues Elise and Sari and I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves before we officially start the presentation. So Elise, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Yes, thank you, Maya. Hi, everyone. My name is Elise Murphy. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Recruitment, working in the Office of Graduate Admissions and Recruitment alongside Maya and our colleague, Sari. Happy that you're joining us today. It's a great um, opportunity to learn about our admissions requirements and some of our important dates for the upcoming OTCAS application cycle. Um, we're certainly here to talk a lot about the admissions process, but we're happy to answer any questions you have about our OT program as well. I know later on in the presentation, Maya will share some upcoming events that we hope you'll engage with um, both virtually and on campus in addition to today's events. So it's great to connect with you virtually and I look forward to talking with you all today. So thanks so much. My name, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, is Sari. I am the admissions coordinator in our Office of Graduate Admissions here at UNE who works with the Master of Science in Occupational Therapy program. Uh, we appreciate you all being here today and your interest in our program and in UNE. And we look forward to sharing some information with you both about admissions requirements and also a little bit about UNE itself and what it's like to live here in Portland. Um, so with that, I look forward to connecting with you hopefully over the upcoming cycle and helping to support you through the application process. So thank you, uh, Maya and Elise. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Uh, just a little bit of an introduction to the presentation today. The format of the presentation will be as follows. Uh, I will start off by kind of giving a general overview about UNE and a little bit about Maine. Then I'll pass it over to Sari, who will go over everything OTCAS admissions, how to apply to our occupational therapy program, important dates to keep note of um, admissions requirements, prerequisites, application recommendations, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. We will hold the Q&A until the end, but feel free to enter any questions that may kind of arise for you as the presentation continues in just the Q&A function, and then we will be sure to answer those once we get to that section of the presentation. So, if you're just joining us here at the University of New England or kind of just starting your journey into researching MSOT programs, first of all, thank you so much and welcome to our community. We are proud to say that we are the number one provider for health professionals in the state of Maine. UNE is located in Maine in northern New England, and we are committed to educating health leaders who truly make a difference for their patients' lives and the communities that they kind of find themselves in after graduating from UNE. We also have over 12 graduate and doctoral health-related programs. So we don't just have occupational therapy students, we also have athletic training, dental medicine, nurse anesthesia, and the list just goes on and on. And in addition to that, we do value interprofessional education and collaboration, which means that while you're a student at the University of New England, you're learning with and from students who are in other areas of and fields of study like physical therapy, physician assistant, et cetera. Next slide, please, Sari. Thank you so much. 
We also have two campuses in Maine, which is important to note. The campus that OT students study on is our Portland campus, and then about half an hour away, a little further down south, is our Biddeford campus. We are an hour and 45 minutes from Boston, which is great if you like the big city. However, Portland is just as much of a cultural and artistic hub as Boston is, and is a nice quaint seaside town slash city um, that is really fun to live in. As a student, a graduate student on the Portland campus, even if you are taking classes and kind of mainly on the Portland campus, you do have access to facilities on the Biddeford campus. The Biddeford campus has a library, gym facilities, a pool, and lots of great uh, space and acreage to kind of be able to immerse yourself in nature and campus life in. So if we, we'll move to the next slide. We have a picture of the Biddeford campus, which boasts 4,000 feet of water frontage. The Biddeford campus has its own beach, which is great for students to kind of take a break from classes or school life and enjoy life by the water. So this is a snapshot of our Biddeford campus. And if we move on to the Portland campus photo, this is a little bit further north, like I said, about 30 minutes from Biddeford. And this is where, as an OT student, you would be completing most of your classes unless you're out on fieldwork placements. And one great thing about our Portland campus is that it is totally graduate student focused, which means that all of the campus services that you will find here are catered and curated for graduate students. We have health services, counseling services, we have our own gym here, a library, as well as a student academic success center, student financial services, and a myriad of other student service offices that are, like I said, curated for graduate students. So this is a really fun campus to kind of be a part of because you're surrounded with other graduate students who are interested in the health professions and are pursuing their graduate degrees, whether that be in occupational therapy or in other programs. And like I said, we are located in Portland, Maine, which if you didn't know, another term or word that people associate with Maine is vacation land, and I think that word just encompasses the state of Maine in the perfect way. It's a phenomenal place to live and to learn. You know, in the same day, within an hour, you can be kind of relaxing at the beach, and then you can be in the mountains. There's a lot of diversity of nature, of people, of arts, food, and culture. And it's just a really vibrant community that we would love for you to be a part of. So I'll go ahead and kick it over to Sari, who will definitely get more in depth about our OT program specifically and the admissions process. Great. Thanks so much, Maya, for sharing a little bit of information with us, both about UNE and about Maine and Portland in general. Um, it is a great place to live. I can vouch for it as someone who was born and raised in Maine. Um, it's a wonderful community to be a part of. Um, so moving on to our occupational therapy program. Before we dive too deep into admissions requirements, I just wanted to uh, sort of share a few key highlights that we feel make our program a really excellent choice for your graduate education. Um, so to begin with, we are the largest and longest standing occupational therapy program here in Maine. So we uh, opened our program in 1981 and graduated our first class in 19 have really strong established connections um, and alumni as part of our greater UNE community here. And some more about our program, our students engage in service learning and collaborative practice. So whether that's partnering with the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital or the Boys and Girls Clubs to support a variety of youth and pediatric needs, um, collaborating with the Westbrook Housing Authority to conduct risk assessments for older adult residents, or working with harm reduction programs at one of our local prisons, there are so many ways that our students make a difference every single day just by virtue of the curriculum in the communities that they serve. Um, so we also uh, offer interprofessional educational opportunities, as my colleague Maya mentioned. Um, one advantage to being a student here is you will get to engage, interact with, and learn from students in other health professions, which will serve you really well when you are out in the field as a practicing occupational therapist. A big part of your job will be working with these other healthcare professionals to meet the emotional, mental, and physical needs of your clients. Um, so we are able to 
really help support our students um, along that journey and teach them really well how to work with others um, in a healthcare or human services setting. And, you know, very importantly, I would like to note that we have a high pass rate for the uh, National Board Licensing Exam. Um, we have a 98.5% pass rate within one year of graduation. So now we'll start to kind of shift into the application components. Um, we've shared a little bit about, you know, what you may be looking for in a program. Um, some of the things that we are going to be looking for in students for our programs are, you know, potential future leaders, um, applicants that demonstrate leadership skills. As a future occupational therapist, a big part of your job is going to be advocacy. So having those skills right off the bat is definitely going to serve you well. A community-based focus or applicants who have demonstrated a commitment to community service or service work um, just shows us that your values align with ours as an institution. So we really like to see that when we're reviewing an applicant. And of course, as a graduate level program, we do like to see that you are academically adept. So we'll be looking at your grades and coursework, particularly prerequisite courses and other highly recommended courses that serve as your foundation to be a successful student in our occupational therapy program. And of course, as I've mentioned before, a collaborative nature is really important. So we're looking for students who have demonstrated that they can work well in a team or work well in a group, because again, this will be such an important part, both of life here at UNE and when you go out in the field as a practicing OT. A care for others, emotional intelligence, and cultural competence are other qualities that we really feel um, make a strong future provider, as well as excitement for the chosen profession. Um, if you have chosen OT, I think you know that says a lot about you and the qualities that we're looking for, both that care for others and that you've chosen this profession to begin with as your future career. Um, but we want to know specifically what drove you to OT as what is your passion for the profession? so to speak. Um, so we'd love to learn that about you and see that reflected perhaps in your essays and experiences when you apply. And of course, we do really like to see students whose personal values kind of uh, align with our institutional mission. So the mission of the UNE OT program is to develop innovative and collaborative OT practitioners and leaders who respond to the dynamic needs of people and communities to support and help health and wellness through occupational engagement. So we like to see um, students whose personal values align with our own. So now moving into the application dates, if you are planning to apply for the OT program beginning summer 2025, the cycle is opening fairly quickly. Um, we are going to open the on the OK, OTCAS application portal July 19th. Um, so get ready, it's right around the corner. Uh, our occupational therapy application deadline is rolling. However, we strongly recommend that you apply as early as possible in the admission cycle, just to give yourself the best chance at an interview and full consideration for admission to the program. All applicants to our OT program must apply through the Centralized Application Service for Occupational Therapy, or OTCAS. And again, if I can say it once, I'm gonna say it again, we do just encourage you to apply as early as you can in the application cycle. As far as preferred GPA, we do not have a hard cutoff minimum. We do have preferences both for overall and prerequisite GPA. Those are the two main GPAs that we look at when reviewing an applicant's uh, file. So our preferred overall GPA would be 3.0. Your overall GPA consists of all the coursework you took at the undergraduate level or higher with no forgiveness for retake. So if you got a low grade on a course one time, you retook it, um, OTCAS will calculate your GPA to include both grades of the course, not just the highest grade. It's important to keep that in mind as you're trying to get a sense of what your academic profile looks like. The other main GPA that we look at is the prerequisite GPA. And this is calculated by us over in UNE's Office of Graduate Admissions. And we calculate this GPA using the highest grade that you received for each prerequisite course. So sort of the opposite of that first GPA. If you didn't do, do so well in a prerequisite course on your first attempt, but you re retook it and got a higher grade, we will only consider for the prerequisite GPA that higher grade from the retake. And we also understand that, you know, maybe some students uh, had maybe a rough semester as they transitioned into their undergraduate career. For that reason, as a holistic review school, we also look at your last 60 credit hour GPA as calculated by OTCAS. 
We do have a degree requirement for application to the OT program. Um, so all applicants to our program must have completed a bachelor's degree from a US regionally accredited institution or an international equivalent prior to the time you would matriculate um, in our program. So you definitely don't have to have your bachelor's degree completed when you apply, but we will want to see on your application your anticipated date for that degree, um, just so that we're aware that you're going to meet that requirement. If you did complete your degree internationally or complete international coursework outside of your degree, you do have to submit to OTCAS an official course by course World Education Services or WES ICAP evaluation. So that's the specific type of evaluation we need for that international coursework um, and the service that we would require it to be from. Now, if you completed any coursework at an English speaking Canadian institution, that requirement would not apply, uh, apply to you. You wouldn't need to submit the WES evaluation as we'll be able to review your transcripts via OTCAS. Everyone else though that completed international coursework would have to adhere to that requirement. So really quickly, um, here is a layout of the prerequisite courses that we require for admission to our program. So each OT program will have specific courses that students would need to complete to be eligible for admission. We definitely don't require that these be completed at the time you apply but it's certainly helpful to keep in mind what courses you will need to complete prior to your anticipated matriculation date. So you can see which courses require a lab, how many credits are required, and sort of what the subject would be for that prerequisite. I wanna quickly draw attention to the human development lifespan prerequisite, as that is the prerequisite that we tend to get the most questions about. Um, that must be a human development course that spans the entire lifespan from birth to death, so not just a segment of it or a combination of human development courses that would span that duration. Um, and if you do intend to use a developmental psychology course to fulfill that requirement, it may be worthwhile to reach out to our Office of Graduate Admissions and just make sure that the course you intend to use to fulfill that prerequisite would meet our requirement. And we'll include uh, contact information on one of the following slides. Again, you don't have to write all this down. We do have all this information available on our admissions page for you. So all those courses on the previous slide would need to be successfully completed with a grade of C or better prior to your anticipated matriculation date. So if you're applying for the current cycle, then you would need to plan to have those courses completed with that grade of C or better prior to May, 2025. Um, we would not accept C minus grades. It would need to be that C or better grade. And we do strongly encourage you to uh, include all planned or in progress coursework on your OTCAS application when you apply. Um, it's helpful for us to see if you do have one or more prerequisites outstanding, that you know this is a requirement and you do have a plan in place to complete the required coursework. Um, you can also, if you're not sure at the time you apply which courses you will take, go in and utilize OTCAS's academic update feature during designated periods in the admission cycle to update your application with more planned in progress or completed coursework. And I'll talk about that further on um, some of the later slides. All our science prerequisite coursework must be completed no more than seven years prior to May 2025 if you're applying this cycle or prior to your anticipated um, start term if you're applying in a future cycle. So if this applies to you and perhaps you've gone on to have a career and have a little bit of a gap in your academic career, it's worthwhile just reviewing your transcripts um, to make sure that you are taking into account that seven year limit for the science prerequisites. And then finally, a maximum of six AP or advanced placement or international bachelorette IB credits may be substituted for the introduction to psychology and English prerequisites only. We will not accept AP or IP, IB credit for other courses. And in addition to those required courses, we also have some courses we recommend. We feel that these will just help make a stronger foundation for you as a future OT and a student acclimating acclimating to a rigorous professional program such as our own, but we don't require that you take these. It would really be um, just an added benefit for you and something that you know we might like to see to strengthen an application. These courses would be medical terminology, introduction to occupational therapy, and APA seventh edition formatting. And again, not required at all, but if any of them sound interesting to you or you wanna kind of give yourself a little leg up for your future career as an OT student, um, certainly, if you have the chance to fit these into your schedule, I'd encourage you to do so, but they are not required. 
So now we're going to talk about the different components you will need via OTCAS to complete your application. So that will consist of transcripts, letters of evaluation, observation hours, and then your personal statement. Beginning with transcripts, these must be submitted to the OTCAS Processing Center. We will include that information and address on the following slide. It's important to note that you must submit to OTCAS transcripts from all colleges, universities, community colleges, or online programs when you apply, even if you only took one course. Failure to send in transcripts for all institutions you attended, unfortunately, will cause significant delays in the verification of your application through OTCAS. Um, so it's really just important that you remember, even if you took one course at a community college a million years ago, um, OTCAS will still need that transcript to verify your application. And transcripts should be submitted to OTCAS unless we request them directly um, from our Office of Graduate Admissions. Um, again, I'll talk more about the academic update feature on the following slides. So like I said, this is where you would send all your transcripts when you apply through OTCAS. And again, just make sure that you do um, submit all those transcripts from each institution you attended. The next component we'll talk about are letters of evaluation. Um, for UNE's purposes, we require a minimum of two letters of recommendation or evaluation, and those must be submitted via OTCAS as well. These letters of evaluation should come from individuals who can speak to your academic abilities, maybe your professional experiences, or both. Um, you are able to request up to five letters of recommendation through the OTCAS evaluation portal, which is the part of the OTCAS application you would use to request these references. Um, so if certainly if you have more than two people who want to speak on your behalf and tell us a little bit more about you and what you have to bring to our incoming class, we're eager to get to know you better through those references and encourage you to reach out to additional recommenders. Um, and it is just important to note that, as I mentioned, these should be academic or professional references. We will not accept letters of recommendation from friends or family members. So as you're thinking about who to consider for potential sources or references, here are some additional considerations as to what we're looking to get from those references and learn from about you and what you have as unique strengths. Areas you might want to highlight or focus on when you're thinking about good sources for your recommendations are your adaptability, your conflict resolution, your empathy, your intellectual ability, your ability to relate with others, your oral and written communication skills, reliability, self-awareness, and team skills. These are all sort of soft qualities that we feel um, will really come through in evaluations uh, better than they may on paper. So just help support your already strong application, just make sure you're being intentional and thoughtful when you select your references, um, because we're gonna learn a lot about you um, sort of through the people that you interact with on a personal level. Observation hours. We actually don't require observation hours to apply to our OT program, but we do strongly encourage you if you have the opportunity to engage in volunteer shadowing or work experience in a health or human services related setting um, to take advantage of those opportunities. While these experiences aren't required, they will give you some valuable exposure to the healthcare or human services setting, how different providers collaborate with one another. Um, so they're really valuable experiences, both for your own personal and professional growth. And as far as um, the admissions perspective, it's valuable for us to see that you've engaged with these experiences and these environments. All observation hours, if applicable, should be documented in the OTCAS application. There is an experiences section where you will be able to record each specific experience that may be relevant to your application, including where the experience took place, your supervisor for the experience and contact information, number of hours at that particular experience, and then a description of the experience. Your personal statement is a little bit different than some of the other materials we talked about. Um, the reason being this personal statement is really the most personal, if you will, way we have of getting to know you. The other application factors are really helpful um, and very good academic indicators and indicators of other um, sort of soft skills and things we look for as well. But your personal statement is just that, it's personal. Um, and we really want to get to know you and your unique strengths. Um, what your passion, as I mentioned, is both for the profession and what you intend to give back to um, future clients and communities. This will be shared across all programs you apply to. 
So it's very important that you don't personalize this essay for one specific program, because all programs that you do apply to, if you are applying to multiple OT programs, will see it. So it's good to keep it specific to you, but not specific to an OT program. You will have to respond to the prompt uh, in OTCAS and then upload your essay response to OTCAS. Um, the most recent prompt asked students to explain why they selected occupational therapy as a career and how the degree relates to immediate and long-term professional goals. Uh, this is a great place to, again, share your lived experiences and how those have shaped you into who you are and who you will be as a future OT. So after you submit your application, unfortunately, clicking that button doesn't mean you're done. Um, there are a couple things to keep in mind as you navigate the remainder of the application process. The first being, after you submit your application, um, please just make sure to monitor that status via OTCAS. OTCAS won't reach out to you directly if you're missing an application item and verification has been delayed. We will only review a verified application, so it's really important that you are keeping track of that progress. For example, if one of your transcripts went missing in the mail or something like that, um, we don't want to let that hold up your application as we are eager to review it. So just make sure that you are um, on top of checking the status of your application through OTCAS. If in any way you are unsure whether your application is verified or not, we're always here to help. So don't hesitate to reach out to our Office of Graduate Admissions and we can give you an update on the status of your application. Once we do receive your verified application through OTCAS, we will reach out to you if you are missing materials um, or we need some additional information from you. Uh, it's really important to monitor your email that you listed on your OTCAS application very regularly for communications throughout the application cycle, as some of these might be time sensitive. Um, for example, if you were selected for an interview invitation, there may be a limited window in which you uh, must complete this assessment, for example, um, or other things that may come up throughout the cycle that are time sensitive. So I encourage you all to regularly monitor that email address for communications from our office. And as I mentioned, um, utilizing the OTCAS academic, period, academic update period is a great way to keep us informed of your academic progress, particularly if you did really well in a semester, we want to know about it, um, or if you have that prerequisite coursework that you had not completed when you applied, it's very helpful for us to know um, that you have gone ahead and completed that requirement. Um, so OTCAS will actually recalculate your GPA using your new coursework if you submit your transcript during the academic update period. Um, so again, just a great way to keep us tuned into what you're doing. We're very interested after you apply, it's not done. Um, we want you to keep updating your experiences and your academics as you're able. So that period has not been published yet for the upcoming cycle, um, but it should be sometime between like December and February typically is when the academic update period would take place. And OTCAS will update that on their Applicant Help Center, um, I believe July 12th. So again, completed applications must have all the components that we discussed on the previous slides. Um, applications are complete, considered complete at UNE when we do receive those materials. And again, if you're missing anything, we'll definitely reach out via email. So just make sure you are checking your email throughout the process. Before you apply, Please make sure you visit our admissions page and don't hesitate to reach out to our Office of Graduate Admissions with any questions. Um, I'm happy to help you with anything that might be confusing or you're not sure about. That's what I'm here for, is to help you navigate this uh, journey to become an OT student. Um, so once your application is complete, we will let you know via email. And we do communicate with applicants through the email that's listed on their OTCAS application. So once again, if I haven't said it enough, um, just make sure you are monitoring that email. So the next phase in the application process um, would be the interview process. It is important to note that interviews are by invitation only. So not all applicants, unfortunately, will receive an interview invitation, um, but they are a required part to be eligible for admission to our program. So again, keep an eye on that email. Um, the Office of Graduate Admissions and Recruitment will communicate interview invitations to qualified applicants um, as those interview sessions occur. For the upcoming 2024-2025 application cycle, we will be conducting our interviews virtually through a platform called Cura Talent. It's an asynchronous online assessment platform where you'll be um, asked questions and then given a set time to respond and record your answers. So with that, 
I think I have shared a little bit about the application process and UNE OT. I really look forward to answering some of your questions during the Q&A. And with that, I will hand things over to my colleague, Elise. Thank you so much, Sari. Well, that was some really informative information and we hope that we can spend the next couple of minutes unpacking some of it and clarifying um, any questions that you have. Um, but I just wanna mention some upcoming opportunities uh, this summer and we will have future opportunities to connect with um, both the Office of Graduate Admissions and Recruitment, but more importantly, uh, the Occupational Therapy Program. So since you registered for today's event, we have you within our communication system. So um, over the coming weeks, you'll receive um, event invites for some of our virtual sessions as well as on-campus opportunities. And I want to make um, particular mention today of some upcoming opportunities that may interest you. Um, we will have throughout the month of July and August uh, opportunities for students to visit campus. We have um, some campus tours going on right now. So if you're interested in visiting our Portland campus, it's a great time to come up to Maine and um, you know, see campus, but also see the area and maybe check out some of the beaches. Um, but we will have opportunities to connect with the OT program too. Our OT program is um, happy to uh, show you around campus. We have a great OT lab and um, some facilities that you'd be able to tour and actually sit down and meet our faculty and current students. So this grad.une.edu is sort of your portal in to access some of these events. Um, and if you're unable to make it to campus this summer, we will have future opportunities to visit. Um, we definitely recommend if you're able to take the time to come up and just get a, a feel of our community in person, because that's going to make a difference in um, sort of uh, you learning more about our program and understanding if this is the right fit for you. But um, in addition to on-campus opportunities, we do have some virtual events that are um, coming up pretty quickly. And uh, the middle of July, on uh, July 17th, we're actually going to sit down with our program director, um, Dr. Chris Winston, to talk about the advantages of an MSOT degree versus an OTD. So as you're exploring what is the right path, we know that um, you're passionate for occupational therapy, you know, but what is the right path heading towards an MSOT or an OTD? This is a great session to learn about the differences, the similarities, and, you know, what might be the right degree for you. So we invite you to that. And then in the end of August, we're gonna have a virtual open house with um, our program to introduce you to our curriculum, um, the, the process for field work and where students complete their field work experiences, but we'll also sort of um, introduce you to the whole community. Our OT program is a tight knit, um, very close community, very supportive. So you'll have an opportunity to hear from our students and faculty about their experience, what they love about UNE and the OT program. Um, so we'd love for you to join those sessions. And certainly if you're watching this recording later, um, we hope that you'll join us too. So we'll follow up after today with some of these opportunities, but um, you can go on our website as well um, and register for these upcoming events. So just wanted to mention those as some future ways to connect and learn about UNE's MSOT program. And I think the next slide, we're just gonna share some contact information. So here's contact information for SARI. SARI is gonna be a great point of contact throughout the entire admissions process. So it's a great chance for you to connect with her right now and put a face to the name, but SARI is gonna work with you throughout the entire admissions process. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out with any questions, whether it's um, it's great to reach out before you apply so that you have the information you need to submit uh, you know, a strong application. But certainly after submitting your application, please reach out and you know, um, ask the questions that you need answered and we'll be here to support you. And we also have um, our general mailbox, uh, general um, email um, listed here. You can reach out to that and it will be directed right to Sari. So. Either way, you're going to be connecting with Sari, and you connect to, uh, can connect with myself and Maya too, but certainly around the admissions process, she's your go-to girl. And um, we do invite you to follow UNE's OT program on Instagram. You can look them up at, at UNE um, 
Auk Therapy, a little abbreviated there, but um, it's a great way to see what's happening on campus with our students and just to get a little closer look into the community. So please feel free to give them a follow on Instagram and I'll uh, share it again. Always reach out with questions. It's never a bother. We're never, you know, thinking, oh, this person has reached their email quota for us. So we're just going to ignore them or it's, you know, um, we're not thinking any of those things. We're here to support you and uh, work with you throughout this process. So we don't want you feeling that, you know, um, uh, you can't reach out. So I think that's an important takeaway uh, that we hope you leave with this afternoon. So I think we're through on our presentation. We want to open up the session to Q&A. Um, thank you, Sari, for um, taking down the presentation. So I'm going to at least get the Q&A started. We do have some questions that were submitted through the registration, but as Maya shared, we do um, invite you to submit any questions through our Q&A. Um, before we go into questions, I think it is important to know uh, if anyone is applying in a future cycle, these are admissions requirements for this current cycle, the 24-25 application cycle. And if you're applying in a future cycle, this is great information just to learn about the process and what we require. But we always recommend that if you are applying to a future cycle, please connect with us again so that you know, are there any changes in prerequisite courses? Do we require observation hours or whatever else? You know, there are changes cycle to cycle. So we would hate for you to leave here um, with this information and go into a new cycle and, and not have these updates sort of and, and to be aware of them. So I just at least want to put that out there and certainly um, on the recording for people to know that if you are applying for a future cycle, connect with Sari and, you know, our admissions I'll be team. Here. Yep. yep. <laughs> So, um, Siri, I think the first question I want to ask, because um, you mentioned it a couple of times, and I think it's just a good thing to understand a little bit um, more about um, our uh, admissions committee when reviewing applications. They're reviewing applications on a holistic way. What does that mean? Um, so that's a great question, and it's one of the big reasons I really like working with this program. Um, we see as a holistic review school, the value in the big picture, the full picture of the applicant. So, you know, we understand the importance of academics, strong grades, again, particularly in those courses that we feel build that really solid foundation for your seamless transition into a graduate level program are important. But holistic review means that we also look at a variety of other application factors. We are really interested in getting to know you and your life experiences how those have shaped who you are into the person you are, and again, the future OT that you will be, how you'll fit into our cohort and community here. So we'll look at your experiences, your essays, again, really important, um, and other factors in your application, not just the academic piece. Um, we really want to get to know you. Um, and as a tight-knit community, sort of think about, um, as you would envision yourself sort of in an OT program, how we would envision you in our OT program here. And Sari, what that means too, you shared, you know, experiences, that could also mean just things that you do as a person. You know, if mm -hmm. you are an avid painter or you're, you've been riding horses for 15 years of your life, I think those are components that make you, you, and our mm -hmm. admissions committee really wants to see that. Is that right? Absolutely. And I think as someone who is choosing occupational therapy as a career, you'll put so much of yourself and kind of your individual passions into the ways that you help clients navigate um, their own needs. So I've seen that demonstrated here with our own students um, and their passionate projects that they use to support clients. Uh, for example, at our Adaptive Projects Expo, which is an annual event where our OT community sort of uh, gets a wish list um, from our greater community of certain needs and our students sort of creatively pick a project and come up with these really amazing um, sort of projects that they create to meet these community needs. Um, and some of those projects, you could very much see the individual student represented in the ultimate project that they created, um, while the absolute focus was on the client. Um, sort of creating that focus came from their own personal passion. So it's really interesting to see that reflected. And again, we really just want to get to know you and what makes you you and um, sort of what is going to make you a strong OT, which is not just uh, by no means just academics. 
Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to just remind our applicants that we really do care about what makes you you and that it may feel odd to put some of this information on an application because it's not directly related to, you know, entering an OT program, but don't feel like, um, you know, it's not something that we're really interested in and that you can include it in your application. And Sari, I'm glad that you mentioned the OT um, Adaptive Projects Expo. I wanted to put in the chat and this is also available on YouTube, but this is a great video um, that was done um, from our most recent um, Adaptive Product Projects Expo. Sorry, it's the end of the day. Um, <laughs> this past spring that highlights some of the projects and they really do make a big impact on the communities that they're going to. And I know our students have a lot of fun creating them and um, working you know, through various different problems and, and figuring out how they can create some of these um, some of this equipment for the, the communities that they're going to. So I definitely invite you to take a look at that video. It was really nice and it just gives you more insight into our program and community. So um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, I'm gonna take a quick look at it. Just um, there are sometimes questions that um, we do require some additional context or some information. So if we don't get to your question today, and that's not certainly this one, but you can always follow up with Sari too. Sometimes, you know, um, everyone's journey is very unique and we maybe need some more insight. So uh, we um, may follow up after tonight, today's event. But Maya, did you want to ask a question to Sari and I'll take a look at the one in the Q and A? Yeah, definitely. So I, really love working with the OT program here at UNE because it's such a mix of students that kind of are called to MSOT and to be occupational therapists. So I guess I kind of have a mix of questions for you, Sari. And that's, can you speak to the diverse backgrounds that OT students, current or former students might have come from? And in relation to that, um, is there a preference given to students from Maine, outside of Maine? How does the admissions committee kind of view out-of-state students or view students who might be from um, a non-health professions background, if that kind of makes sense? So if you could speak to that, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And feel free to ask any clarifying questions if I'm not being clear. Um, but first and foremost, we do not give a special preference to in-state applicants. So whether you're in-state or out-of-state, um, if you're a qualified applicant, we would be eager to get to know you a little bit better. Um, as far as backgrounds for our incoming students, we really value diverse life experiences. Um, and like I said, you know, it's, it's so much more than just one thing that makes an OT. Um, so not by any means do all our students have like a med bio major, you know, we might have majors represented all across the board. It's really the sort of inner drive of the person who decides that this is the calling for me and this is what I want to do to help support individuals and communities that we're looking at. And that can be represented in a variety of different ways and across a variety of majors. Um, that being said, um, any major, whether it's you no know, English or art, would still have to complete all those prerequisites. Um, so we do want to see academic success in those courses. Thank you so much. I think that really just speaks to the kind of community that we have here in our OT program and the creative outlooks and different perspectives that we really get to gain from the wide breadth of life experiences and backgrounds of our students. So thank you, Sari. Very nice. And um, I want to come back to this question in the Q&A that Bethany submitted. So um, the question is, so if I have experience volunteering at the hospital, but not in an OT setting, should I still put that into my application since it is health related? Um, so why don't we start with that? And then there is a question. I have had some trouble finding observation hour opportunities. Is there a number of hours that you think looks best on an application? So let's start with that um, experience in the hospital. Should that be included on application, even though it's not in an OT setting? Absolutely. As a future OT, um, this is all really valuable experiences for you. Like, for example, in your field work, you know, you might be at a hospital, so you'll mm -hmm. already be accustomed to that environment. As a future OT, there are so many different practice settings that you might find yourself in, including a hospital. So whether your volunteering or observation there has direct bearing on your future career as an OT, it's all just such valuable exposure to 
healthcare and your future environment, um, potentially as an OT or an OT student. So these are all, again, really valuable experiences. Um, there really is no set number of hours. And again, I think as a holistic review school, that kind of just speaks to the way that we view application factors. Um, so for example, one applicant might have a ton of observation hours that sort of outweigh another factor of their application that may be less competitive versus another you know, person who might have these wonderful unique qualities in another area. And you know, maybe they didn't have observation hours. So um, there really isn't a defined number. It's certainly not a requirement. But if you are able to obtain those experiences, um, they won't just look good on your application. They're going to serve you in your career as an OT student and then later going on to practice in the field. Thank you, Sarah. I think that was a great response uh, to the question there. Um, so again, please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A. Uh, we'll come back to some of that were submitted prior. Um, I, I actually have one for Sari. Uh, yeah, go right ahead, Maya. Say in that. Previously, um, in your answer, you mentioned how a student might, might end up completing fieldwork experience at a hospital. So can you kind of give us a good idea of what kind of fieldwork rotations might be completed throughout the program and if they're set up by our MSOT program or are students kind of having to go find those fieldwork opportunities on their own? So I appreciate that question because this is a really great feature of our program. Um, so after your first introductory foundational semester, you'll actually begin level one field work right in that second semester, and you'll continue field work experiences throughout the rest of your academic career here, um, culminating with two level two field work experiences in your last two semesters here. So just to quickly clarify, uh, level one field work is a shorter duration experience. Um, and less, I would say, immersive than the level two field work. You're at an earlier stage in your journey to become an OT. So you're really sort of soaking up that exposure and learning a lot either through simulated case-based scenarios that may even be interprofessional, possibly even right here on our UNE campus in one of our sophisticated facilities um, that we can adapt to a variety of simulated environments. Um, and then you can watch yourself on video and look back and say, oh, I did that really well, or, mm, you know, I think I learned from watching myself do that, and don't worry, your classmates will do it too. Um, so you'll all go through it together. It's a good bonding experience. Um, or you might be out um, in a community-based experience, like observing in a clinic for that level one field work. Um, and typically those wouldn't be more than like 40 hours, those level one field work experiences. The level two ex uh, field work experiences, however, um, those are 12 weeks long each, and you will complete two rotations. Um, we have over 30 states where you can complete your uh, clinical level two field work placements, um, as well as international opportunities too, which I think is so cool. Um, we have uh, opportunities in Morocco and I believe Ghana and Guatemala currently, um, although we're always open to creating new partnerships and exploring new areas of the globe um, and getting those, again, valuable global and different perspectives. Um, so our students will work closely with our OT faculty. Um, there's a designated person within the OT program who you'll get to know really well during your time here, who will kind of sit you down and take into account your preferences. Um, maybe if you have limitations, like if you have a family, maybe you don't want to go to Hawaii for your field work placement. If you're, you know, right out of undergrad, maybe that sounds pretty great. 12 weeks in Hawaii uh, serving and sort of following your passion, learning a lot, and you get to be in Hawaii. Um, or, you know, you might have a family and you might need a more local fieldwork placement. So um, there are also other factors. Maybe you're interested in a particular population um, so or environment, and we might be able to set you up with sort of um, that preference. We certainly do work to individualize these placements. Um, it's not something you'll have to find for yourself, certainly. Um, and when we are placing students, again, I think it really speaks to the kind of community we have here and our connections. Um, we want your experience to give you as much of what you go into it thinking that you want um, and sort of meeting your needs and also watching your academic progress and how um, you may have areas that we feel like additional exposure would be really valuable for you, sort of balancing those so that you end up with a placement that you're really excited about and we know is gonna just benefit you in that exponential growth as a future clinician. Thank you so much, Sari. That was a great answer. Thank you.
Um, and I know during our virtual open houses and our, our sessions with the program, you'll get to meet um, Professor Walton, who will work with uh, first year students and learning more about their interests and where they may want to be placed for um, their second year. And it's something that you're going to work together on. Maybe, you know, coming in, this is exactly where I want to be, um, or you're open to experiences and Professor Walton will work with you to um, get you placed in the play uh, in the and the right field work that's going to be uh, the best for you and your next steps in your professional journey. And I'm glad you mentioned, Sari, the opportunity to do international field work. Uh, we had a student who graduated um, this May who uh, completed her um, field work, I think it was in Guatemala, right, Maya? Maya? And there are yes. also and there are also opportunities to do some um, more short term short term travel courses where students will go to Morocco or Guatemala, and, and those are interprofessional trips too, where we have some of our PT students join. So opportunities, even in small ways, to travel abroad and understand how occupational therapy is practiced abroad. Maybe one day you're not um, practicing abroad, but there are things that you can learn that you can apply to your own practice here in the United States. So I think some um, opportunities to see uh, globally how occupational therapy is practiced. Um, so we're just coming to the end of our session. We still have a couple minutes left, so we definitely invite any questions. Please feel free to submit them. But again, you can always follow up with us via email. And I know Sari is happy to jump on a, a Zoom or a call with you, too, if you want to personally connect. So, um, Sari, we talked a bit about coursework, and um, we know all of our prerequisite courses are available on our website. Um, and you mentioned that um, students can um, submit their application with planned or in-progress coursework. Is there a certain number that students can have or can't have, or it's just that they have to have a plan for completing their coursework before starting in the program in the summer? I think, you know, there is no set number necessarily, but if we do see somebody that, you know, has like two prerequisites completed, um, that may not be advantageous for you. We may have to hold your application back just for the reason that we can't get a solid enough sense of that foundation um, that is going to be so important to make sure that you're going to be successful in our curriculum. We only admit students who we believe in their potential for success here. Um, so we just want to make sure that we are uh, sort of adequately equipped to support students coming into our program and give them that best experience. Um, it really would be a case-by-case -case basis thing. But I would say it's not uncommon for students to apply with a couple of prerequisites, you know, one or one, two, even a few outstanding. And Sari, just a follow up question. If students are applying with planned coursework, will their applications be held um, to, you know, and held until those co uh, courses are complete or will they be able to be reviewed and potentially invited to interview? I appreciate that question, um, because unless, like I mentioned, it's sort of an extenuating mm -hmm. circumstance where we really just can't get a solid enough sense of your um, academic capabilities with the specific foundation we're looking for. So outside of that, which would be a rare occurrence, um, we would not uh, hold an application back for having you know, one to even a few prerequisites outstanding. Um, what we would do is let you know what you're missing in case you were under the assumption that you know, a course you were planning to take would fulfill the requirement and you know, maybe it doesn't line up exactly with our um, establish prerequisites or course content that we require, or maybe it's something as simple as we think it doesn't and we get a syllabus from you and we can um, review on a case by case basis, that kind of thing. So again, unless it's an extreme extenuating circumstance, um, that wouldn't really be uh, necessarily a negative factor when applying. What it would mean is if you continue through the application process, qualified for an interview, um, were invited to interview, completed the interview, and then were ultimately accepted, if you did have courses that were not completed at that time, we would list them as what are called conditions in your acceptance letter. So you would be clearly, um, you know, given the parameters of what courses you need to complete, and you would just have to complete those with the C or better grade prior to the start of classes in May. So again, um, don't let, you know, missing one or two courses hold you back. We definitely still want to get to know you. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, I do have a follow-up question around interviews, and then maybe we can end with just a question about um, what we enjoy about UNE or living in Portland and, and, and Maine. But um, 
Sari, when do tip interviews typically take place? We understand that um, the application is opening in the coming weeks around Jul mid July, and that we do work on rolling admissions. So when do interviews typically take place and how soon after would a candidate hear about um, their decision? Yeah, so I think um, typically you could expect that our interview uh, cycle would start in September, possibly in August, just depending on uh, admission flow at that time, we do conduct interview sessions on a rolling basis. So there's no, you know, set uh, end for interview sessions, depending on like the needs of our class at that time. Again, a great reason to apply early is you're just giving yourself that uh, best chance at an interview slot if you are really interested in our program. Um, and then depending on when you complete your interview, that would factor into when you might receive a decision from us. But as soon as we are able to um, fully review your application and your interview responses were you to qualify for an interview. Um, that process may take a different amount of time based on the stage in the application cycle, like if you apply earlier versus later um, or later versus earlier, that might impact the timing of your admissions decision. But as soon as we do have an update for you, we will certainly communicate that via email. And it's important to note that uh, to Elisa's point, um, don't be shy. If you're uncertain about your admission status at any point, that's what I'm here for is to help clarify that for you. So feel free to reach out. Awesome. So with just a couple minutes left, it might be nice just to share like um, reasons why we uh, we enjoy working at UNE and why we stay working at UNE and uh, um, what we like about Portland or Maine. I know, Sarah, you're one of only one of us who's actually originally from Maine. <laughs> So Sari, do you want to kick that off and just share a little bit about why you enjoy working at UNE and what you love about living in Maine? Sure. Um, so starting with, I'll start with Maine and I'll end with UNE. Um, I was born in Maine. So luckily, I really liked it here. Um, it's a great place if you're an avid or outdoors person like myself. Um, I love to go hiking, skiing, um, swimming in the lake or the ocean. And Maine is a great place, particularly Portland in the greater Portland area to explore a variety of those interests, as well as immerse yourself in the kind of downtown scene we have here. Um, for those who may not know this, we are a major foodie city and I love to eat. So I feel like every weekend I'm like trying a new restaurant um, and they're usually just like phenomenal and it's hard to pick next time because I'm like, I wanna try something new, but I really want what I had last time. Um, so if you like <laughs> to eat, Portland's a great place to be. Um, we also have a great artistic community here. So our first Friday art walks, for example, we'll have local artists and crafts people come out and like line the sidewalks. You can take a little self-guided tour of like our art galleries and stop by and chat with people about what they've created. It's a really cool experience. And then along the way, as you're walking down those cobblestone streets in Portland, grab a delicious snack, a bite, you know, um, along your way. As far as UNE, I really enjoy being part of this community because of the community itself. Um, I've been here for a number of years and I continue to just be impressed by the people that I interact with every day. It's not just, you know, the staff that I work with here, it's the students, it's the faculty. Um, this is a place that I'm proud to be part of. And so I think that's the reason why I'm still here. That's awesome, Sari. Maya, do you want to share a little um, insight into what you like about Maine and why uh, you're newer to UNE? So what you've learned um, mm -hmm. and experienced um, so far within our community? Yeah, definitely. So like Sari, I'll start with what I like about Maine. Um, I am originally from Nebraska and now I live in Maine and I am staying here for the long haul. Um, what I love about Maine is just the artistic community and I also am a huge outdoorsy person. I love exploring the islands in Casco Bay. I love to camp. I think the first time I got in the water was towards the beginning of May and yes, it was very cold, but it was also very worth it. Um, what I love about UNE, I mean, obviously, Sari stole my answer with that one. The community is just great here. I have loved working with every single person that I've met so far, whether it be in various programs, students, or people within my office. But um, I guess I'll just plug something different. I also love the library staff, and I love our library on the Portland campus. I can get books through interlibrary loan, and they're always willing to help myself as a staff member, but also students out. So plug for the library staff. They're great over there. They are, definitely. And I know we're coming to the end of our time here, so I will be quick. Um, I'm, again, not originally from Maine, but I think what is really 
nice about Maine is it really provides a balanced lifestyle. And as you're entering your um, OT program, you know, you're going to be going through a lot of transitions, transitioning into a graduate program, maybe transitioning into a new community. And there's opportunity to build not just um, sort of a routine and enjoying the beautiful nature that we have, but your own community within uh, the area. So I really like that aspect. And um, I think it's really important as a prospective graduate student for you not only to pursue and look into the program, but the environment that the program is in, not just the, the campus itself, but the community that it's in, because you want to be happy um, and supported because that if you're if you're both of those things, you're going to be successful. So I think Maine creates that balanced lifestyle. And I think that's supported amongst our uh, community as well. You know, what I really like and what I see um, within our faculty and students is a, a dedicated, committed, supportive environment where this is going to be a competitive process. You know, you've worked really hard to get yourself to, you know, applying. But once you're here, you've made it and you're working with one another. You don't need to sort of take tear each other down to get ahead. You're all going to become great occupational therapists and get to the points where you see yourself, but you're going to do it together. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I think on that note, we're going to end our session and we hope that this is a continued conversation that we'll have with you over the next cycle or in future cycles as your path may change but we hope it leads back to you and e and again you know we're really excited that you're here um, considering us and if you have any questions at any point don't re hesitate to reach out to sari myself maya and we'll connect you with the right resources because we're a very friendly approachable and just committed university where like this is what we're here for and uh, we want to help you in that way so thank you both sari and maya some great information shared if you need any clarification on things or if you know a couple weeks later you need a refresher feel free to watch back this recording or connect with us and we hope to see you up in maine soon so thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your evening and sari and maya thanks for your time have a great night i look forward to connecting with you see you soon Thank you. Bye.